apparently if you put sex in the title, everybody shows up. <laughs> <laughs> that I know some of the classes are providing. So, what I want to talk about today is a little bit of what I'm interested in, in uh, life history trait evolution. So, uh, generally life history traits are things about uh, the life cycle and how organisms, what the strategies they employ to do reproduction. And so, what I want to talk a little bit about is uh, how this works in fungi. And one of the things I want to do, because it is Darwin week, I guess we should call it Darwin week officially now, since we do it for a week every year now. Um, since it is Darwin week, I think we need to connect this a little bit to fungi, and I don't think that you normally think of Darwin and, uh, and uh, being involved in mycology and actually doing a lot of fungi. But it turns out, on the voyage of the Beagle, uh, he actually did collect a number of different fungi that were interesting and, this, and he described and or helped describe. Sort of the, one of the most famous ones is this thing here, and I'll show you a real picture of it here in just a second, which is Ceteria, which is a species he found uh, growing in Tierra del Fuego, associated with the southern beach, which is a relative of the, the beech tree that we have in the northern hemisphere, but is unique to the southern hemisphere. Uh, other things that are kind of interesting, he made a number of collections, some of which they actually just rediscovered last year at the Cambridge University Herbarium. They actually found a whole stack of his fungi that he'd collected on the voyage of the Beagle, and that's one of them, a species of Lentinus. Here's uh, Ceteria. This is sometimes called Darwin's Neon Balls, which is kind of a reference here in, uh, in the thing. Uh, it's a, actually a very interesting fun fungus, a member of the Ascomycota, so the sac fungi related to morels and things like that, although it's got its own family within the Ascomycota. Uh, they're parasites of the beech tree, and it's one of the few fungi in the world that people, uh, native peoples around in southern hemisphere places use as a staple food. Uh, these balls actually fill with a kind of sugary liquid, and when they're uh, fresh on, on the trees like this, you can go out and collect them and eat them. And in fact, in Tierra del Fuego, they ferment them and make alcohol out of them as well. So, kind of a cool little thing. What I want to talk more about uh, are some of the ideas Darwin had related to evolutionary trees. And this is sort of one of the sketches from one of his notebooks, the, I think, famous early phylogenetic diagram that he came up with. And a lot of what I do is phylogenetic work. So we look at the evolutionary relationships between species to try to understand things about their evolution, to build better classification schemes so that we can identify things more expeditiously, but also to understand some basic traits in, in, in their evolution. And so what I do and what some of my colleagues do is we use phylogenetic hypotheses as a way to think about uh, character evolution. And that's kind of what I'm going to talk about today, is how we can use phylogenetic hypotheses to understand, in particular, uh, some traits related to mating system evolution is what I'm going to talk about. But you can use this for actually a wide variety of things. And there's actually a number of really cool things that we've learned about the fungi over the last 20 years using phylogenetic trees. For example, a lot of the traditional groups, that, you know, the, the Garrix are guild fungi and the coral fungi and the gastromycetes and stuff, they're not monophyletic at all. And they represent convergences that are due to uh, environmental factors. And if you take mycology or field mycology, we actually talk a lot about that. You might actually get annoyed with me at how much we talk about that. <laughs> what I'm interested in, uh, at least what I'm going to talk about today, is a little bit about the evolution of mating systems. And we'll talk about what mating systems are. But the strategies that fungi use when they choose a mate and how they select a mate and how that's controlled, uh, because what is obvious when you start looking at different groups of fungi, and this is just a genus that I've worked on a lot over the years, what you see within different genera is you see transitions in different mating strategies that show up. And so these colored branches represent uh, adoption of a different mating strategy than is the common one in the rest of the, the, the genus. And that seems to happen in a lot of different genera. And I'm going to talk mostly about some mushrooms called the inky cap mushrooms. This is actually just a really pretty mushroom that I thought I'd throw up here. This is one of the natives to the, uh, the Pacific Northwest forest. You find this one quite a bit in the fall, so if you take field mycology in the fall, plug. Um, we'll go out into the forest up, up uh, in the pass, and pretty commonly in the fall you'll see this thing. This is uh, Mycena pura, which is a very pretty sort of amethyst uh, Mycena. It's just there to 
to say that we're going to talk primarily about the mushroom forming fungi. The reality is, is the mating systems and the way sex works in all the major groups of fungi actually differs quite a bit. Um, this is, and a lot of the basic rules that you guys learn in cell biology about the way cells work don't work necessarily in the fungi either. Uh, for example, the whole sort of one nucleus to a cell thing, the fungi kind of laugh at that. <laughs> Why would you do something that, that simple? So this is just kind of the life cycle of a typical fungi. What I want to call your attention to are just a couple of key points here. Is that the mushroom itself, the fruiting body of the mushroom, is really just there to produce thousands and thousands of spores. Okay? Those spores are the products of meiosis. You can think of them in some ways kind of like gametes, although that's not really the way they behave. Uh, and in fact, the simple life cy cycles that you learn in terms of animals and even plants with alternation of generations don't really fit very well for the fungi. Uh, so the products of meiosis, so what's the nuclear condition then? Come on, somebody. Haploid. haploid, right? So they're haploid, they're products of meiosis, so they have one copy of each of the genes. When they go out, they'll actually grow into a mycelium called the primary mycelium, which is basically has one nucleus per cell in our haploid. Because they only have one copy of each gene, pretty much, not always the case, but for the most part, um, most fungi don't tolerate a lot of deleterious mutations. So if they have mutations that impair function, those tend to be lethal at this stage. Okay? That's actually one of the things that allows them to switch mating types a lot and tolerate more selfing than other kinds of organisms, is because they don't accumulate a lot of genetic baggage. Those primary mycelia can grow indefinitely. They can grow as big as necessary. They will just grow on indefinitely. You can keep it in test tubes forever if you want to. Uh, you have to transfer them occasionally, but as long as you keep feeding them, they'll keep going. Okay, so in the way they grow into individuals that are separate and, and distinct. When they come together and find a compatible mate, they actually, anastomose, so the hyphae actually fuse together, and instead of doing what you'd expect, the nuclei fusing together and make a nice diploid, the fungi don't do that. Um, they make what's called a dicarion, and each cell will have one nucleus of each parental type. Okay? And in fact, they do this weird thing with the construction of this uh, special structure as they grow called a clamp connection that helps maintain that. One of the more elegant things you'll ever see under a microscope is watching the clamp connections. Eventually, after they've grown for a while as, the, as, a, as a dicarion, they will produce mushrooms. And a mycelium that is a dicarion can be, again, infinitely big. In fact, the largest organisms on Earth are dicaryotic mycelia of a uh, uh, species of the genus Armillaria, which are a typical mushroom, the honey mushroom group. They're, they're reasonably good edibles, uh, so if you know where those big mushrooms are, the big mycelia are, you can go find the mushrooms very regularly and, and then eat them. Um, in the mushrooms, they produce basidia. The basidia are the sites of karyogamy, so the nuclei actually fuse together in the basidia, then immediately undergo meiosis. So there is no prolonged diploid phase. Basically, it's one cell, fuse, immediately meiosis, and then you're back at the spores again. So here's just some hyphae, and those are the clamp connections. Uh, one of the other things that's important to realize about fungi is that things are much more flexible than what I'm even describing. The cross walls that separate individual cells actually have a hole in the middle of them, and organelles, including nuclei, can freely go between them. Okay? So normally we think of the cells as being good dicaryons that have one nucleus of each parental type, but it's not so neat and lovely in the sense that they actually can move around. Uh, pretty effectively, <coughs> and I don't think it's this picture, but I actually have a picture of a nucleus squeezing through a, um, the, the cross wall, and you can actually watch that. This is just the formation of the clamp connection. It basically is a, is a growth mechanism, basically to sort the nuclei and to ensure that each cell gets two nuclei, one from each parental type. So basically the way this happens is at the tip of the, the uh, at the tip of the, the, the hyphae, the, when it starts to grow and it, it exceeds some certain size and needs to divide, um, it starts by forming a branch. One of the nuclei will migrate into the branch, then they do a synchronous mitotic division, 
And then the cross wells divide and sort of cut them off so that you get one cut off there and one there. And then this little branch grows back and fuses back and dumps its nucleus back into the cell behind. It's a really weird process to watch. And it's completely unique for the for the for the the city of my seeds. Okay, in fact that's one of the main characteristics of a lot of the city of my seeds is that they produce these clamp connections. And here's just a, this is a daffy stained image. So you can see the clamp connection here, and these two bright dots are the nuclei stained with daffy, which fluoresces <coughs> and binds to the nuclei. Um, and that's sort of the typical condition. Then as they produce the mushrooms, and again, these mycelia grow, can be almost infinitely large. They produce mushrooms whenever the conditions are right. Uh, that's ultimately where you're going to have fusion of the nuclei, and then production of the cidia and the cidia spores that get released out, usually into the air. And in different groups of fungi, the spores are very different in terms of their, their shape and, and structure. But ultimately what grows out is a mycelium. So this is just the spread of a mycelium, this highly branched sort of set of tubes that interconnect and basically make up the main body, the somatic body of a typical fungus. Okay. Now, one of the things I want to mention here is that I mentioned that the nuclear condition is not so nice and neat. Um, there are a couple of things that we know happen, we don't understand particularly well, but are, are really very interesting. In that, if this is a monocarion, it can fuse through sexual compatibility with other monocarions to make a dicarion. Dicarions themselves can actually fuse with other dicarions or monocarions. And then there's actually this thing called internuclear competition that happens occasionally where the new nucleus can actually migrate throughout a whole mycelium and actually replace one of the original ones. And so in a lot of ways these mycelia are much more mosaic-like and more fluid than what we think of. I mean it's essentially like if you replaced your mom's DNA later on at some point in time with somebody else that you thought would be a better donor. And that's totally possible in uh, fungi. And again, these mycelia can get really, really large. So there are a couple of humongous fungi they talk about in forests. This one's in Michigan. Uh, there's another one in Oregon. Uh, and they debate back and forth about who's got the larger one. But it's basically just a very large mycelium that spreads over acres and acres in the forest. Okay. Within the environment, though, mycelia don't just sort of cross and they interact with each other. So one of the important things to understand about mycelium, even though they do some weird things genetically and in terms of their nuclear behavior, they do some really weird things, um, they do behave more or less like individuals. And an individual mycelium, particularly when it encounters a, a mycelium of a different species, they'll actually partition up their environment. So fungi grow through and in their food. So if you look at, for example, a, a, a cut tree, what you'll see very often if that tree's been allowed to rot for some time on the ground, uh, you'll actually see these zones that are cut off in the tree. And basically, each one of these zones represents a different individual mycelium. And often you can actually see these just by looking at a cut piece of the tree because they make dark, lines of thickened hyphae that have pigment in them right along the edge. And you'll, you'll basically, they basically sequester off their food supply from everybody else's. And they try to compete across those lines, but often it's very difficult for them to do that. Uh, fungi produce a large number of uh, compounds that are inhibitory for other fungi and bacteria, and so they do a lot of uh, uh, interference competition is what they refer to that as. Uh, when they're uh, using uh, chemical warfare, basically, to, to fight each other off. And the substrates that fungi can occupy can be really large, like a forest, or they can be really pretty large, like a tree, or they can be really small, like a little ball of herbivore dung. Okay? But the properties are always the same. It's, they're going to be competing over those resources that are available in that limited area. Okay, so what happens when a mycelium encounters another mycelium? And that's really what I want to talk about. Um, so there are several possibilities, some of which actually involve sexual reproduction, and some of them don't. 
Okay, we're going to talk about the ones that don't first, and then we'll get back to the sex part of it, because that's the fun stuff, right? <laughs> okay, so one of the things that, that fungi do is when two mycelia encounter each other, if they're probably the same mating type, but they have uh, differences in what are called hetero... Uh, heterocarion compatibility alleles or het alleles. Basically these are alleles uh, that have other functions other than sexual compatibility. Uh, if they're different for those, sometimes when they come together they can actually form a heterocarion. So they'll, the mycelia actually merge together and you'll have cells that'll have nuclei from both donors in them. Okay. So if we look at what happens, normally these heterocarions that form, when it's not involving sexual compatibility, they're not particularly stable, so they don't last very long, uh, and they typically stay right in the zone where the things make contact. But when they do this, they can exchange other things, like mitochondria, uh, turns out fungi get lots of viruses, uh, some of which uh, don't seem to have any real negative impact and may actually provide genes that help. They actually behave kind of like plasmids or things like that. So there are some weird things that go on with viruses in exchange when they do this kind of heterocarion uh, anastomosis. Okay, so typically if they're not mating compatibility, if they have the same mating alleles, for example, they they don't last. They, they deteriorate pretty quickly. And basically what that means is one of the nuclei dies in the zone where you have the heterocarion. One of them wins and takes possession of that mycelium. It may be the original, it may not. Okay. When we have sexual compatibility, that's when heterocarions, we get the dicarion, and heterocarions actually can be stable for a long time. Okay. And that seems to be something that's completely unique to the, the, the basidiomycetes. If you look at ascomycetes, they do this heterocaryosis thing uh, quite a bit, but it's always unstable, it doesn't last very long, and it breaks down very quickly. So in the basidiomycetes, the dicaryons involve sexual compatibility, and we'll talk about the alleles that control that here in just a second, and that seems to be something that can actually last <coughs> a very long time, depending on the situation. <laughs> so, I want you to think about life as a single spore for a second. So, you have a mushroom, it produces a whole bunch of spores, and then spreads them out into the environment. Where do most of them end up? Right next to the mushroom that produced them. Okay? Uh, typical mushroom, the way it disperses spores is it ejects them forcibly between the actual gills that hang down, and then they just drop by gravity. And so once they hit, if they hit air currents, they can get picked up and carried some distance, but uh, they've actually done some, uh, this uh, grad student at, uh, in Oregon actually did a really nice study where she laid out slides away from mushrooms and tracked how far the spores go. And based on the numbers of spores that are dispersed per unit <laughs> time, and the numbers she collected on these little tape slides, um, Almost all of them fall within about two feet of the mushroom itself. So most of them in, end up very close. And so one of the questions that you have to ask yourself is, is it a good idea to have sex with your relatives? Right? Because everybody in that pool of spores is a relative. They're from the same pairing of nuclei. So genetically they're same, the same. So you have a high potential for inbreeding. Okay? And so if we look at what's going on in the fungi in terms of controlling mating, basically there are fungi out there that don't do anything. They don't control it at all. Basically any mycelium that's the same species they can merge with and potentially have, have offspring with. Even if it's just another branch of the same mycelium. Okay, those are referred to as homothallic and basically they don't really need a partner and they don't genetically regulate anastomosis to the degree that other species do. Heterophallic species, which are in some ways the more interesting ones, um, have some sort of genetic regulation. They have what are called incompatibility alleles or, or mating type alleles that 
if you have the same mating type allele, you can't mate. Okay, if you have the same mating type allele, you probably got it from the same ancestor, so it limits the amount of inbreeding. So in that collection of spores that all came from the same fruiting body, you have a reduced chance that you're going to mate with your siblings and hopefully then mate with uh, a spore from another mushroom someplace else. That's a different genetic individual. Okay. So if we look at the heterothallic fungi, there are a couple of patterns that, that are predominant. I'm going to talk mostly about bipolar and tetrapolar heterothallism. Uh, if you talk about other kinds of fungi other than mushrooms, then you have to talk about two-factor heterothallism, and there are actually a couple more out there. The simplest one for mushrooms is one called bipolar heterothallism. They have a single set of genes. So when I talk about these things, they're actually not single genes. They're actually cassettes or, or groups of genes that are inherited together. And they function basically as a single gene with several different alleles. Okay. The A alleles in bipolar heterothallism actually are a pheromone production and pheromone receptor set of alleles. Basically, it's producing chemicals that are attractive to the other mating type and the receptors that allow them to actually perceive that. Okay. And typically what we think of when we think about bipolar heterothallism the way it works is that if you, you have two spores or two mycelia that come together, they have to differ with respect to those genes. They have to have different alleles for, those, for that gene. So we tend to number them, sort of A1 through whatever is in the population, and in many cases there can be dozens of them. Uh, the biggest number for A alleles we know of is over 100 in a species as a whole. <coughs> So when they come together, they have to differ. So if you think about this, if you take a bunch of spores from a single mushroom and you pair them up, so you take one, you cross it times itself, you take one, cross it times a bunch of others. When you do that, about half the time you should expect that they should be different. Remember, because the parents had to be different. So you had two alleles that came together to, to make the dicarion that you started with. Then the nuclei fuse and go through meiosis, and those things assort so that you basically have A1 or A2, for example, as the alleles that end up in the spores and then in the mycelia, mycelia that grow from there. And so when you do these crosses, basically, they never work out this neatly because you just assign the numbers by random. And then you do all these crosses, and about half the time you should ex expect successful matings if it's bipolar. So that's a big improvement over something that's homothallic, which essentially probably most of the time would be selfing or it would be mating with sibs and do inbreeding. So you have much better outcrossing when you do, when you have a bipolar heterothallism than you do when you have uh, no mechanism. This is just again the same sort of thing. It gets even better because if there are more alleles in the population, pretty much the only ones that you're not going to mate with are your sieves. You're going to have reduced mating with your sieves. Everybody that you run into that's from a different individual and has a different set of mating type alleles, those are compatible. So this ends up ensuring a really high degree of outcrossing, even better than the, the baseline 50% that you might expect. Tetrapolar heterothallism is even better, because what we've done there is we've added another factor. So in tetrapolar heterothallism, the A alleles, again, are the pheromone producer or receptor sets. The B alleles, in this case, actually are regulating dicarion formation and hyphal fusion. In the, in the bipolar species, it seems that they have those genes. They just don't have different versions that discriminate. So they're missing some of the, the there's a homeobox uh, uh, domain that's associated with these things that actually controls some of the regulation of that. They don't seem to regulate the discrimination, so anybody with a B allele is, is good. Okay, when you do the experiment of crossing these, and some of you who take mycology will end up doing this this, this time, uh, when you cross the single spores from a single fruiting body this way, what you end up with are about a quarter of the matings end up working out. And again, in a population as a whole, 
you end up with a fairly large number of alleles out there that are possible. So that you have a hard time mating with your siblings, but you have an easy time mating with different individuals that have a different set of mating alleles. So outcrossing is again ensured. Now, one of the interesting things is they often talk about this as fungi having hundreds of sexes, right? Because in Schizophyllum community, which is the best studied uh, fungus for mating type alleles, there are more than 100 A alleles and more than 60 B alleles. So all those combinations essentially represent a different sex in the, the mating pattern. Um, it's, it's a ridiculous number of combinations that you have possible out there. And again, about a quarter of the time from a single free body. If you want to do this, the experiments are really easy. You basically just isolate single spores, which actually sounds easier than it is. I have some really fine dental picks that we actually use to cut individual spores out on a, on a petri dish. You transfer them, you make sure they just have one nucleus per cell, you grow them up, and then you pair them up. And then you go in and look in the interface zone, and eventually you can look across the whole thing, but you look for the presence of clamp connections. If they have clamp connections, they basically can mate, and in theory, if you grew them long enough, you could make a mushroom that would actually make through meiosis. Okay, from an evolutionary perspective, and I want to get back to the pattern of this uh, here. Uh, from an evolutionary perspective, in the mushrooms, the tetrapolar mating system is the ancestral one. In other things like the tremolales, the auriculariales, which are some of the jelly fungi, and the, the rust and smuts, bipolar, that's the bipolar. They're predominantly bipolar. Uh, tetrapolar heterothalism, though, is the, the ancestral condition for the, the mushrooms. Then within that, you have a bunch of things that have basically given up their mating system. And that's ultimately what I want to talk about, is why would they choose to do this? Choose maybe not the right word, it's kind of anthropomorphic, but why would they give this up? Okay. In the fungi, there, in the, the mushrooms, there are a couple of different mechanisms that we have that they basically can give up their mating system and, and give up that selection of, of mating that's genetically determined. Uh, one of them is basically just the genes become non-functional and they don't recognize differences anymore so they can mate with whoever they come across, even if that's themselves. Okay. Another option actually has to do with packing spores. I'm going to show you a picture of this uh, because I think it's a little clearer from the picture. Basically, if you put a couple of nuclei in a spore, you can actually set it up so that right from the beginning they have both of the nuclei that they're going to need. In which case, if you do that, you almost never have another individual involved. So secondary homothalism basically is, is packaging two compatible nuclei into a single spore and then right from the get-go, it's dikaryotic. It can grow for a little bit and then produce a mushroom, no problem. Okay. Homothalism within the mushrooms is derived. I'll get to why that's important here in just a minute. So it's, it's interesting because it's a derived condition. When we go in and look at the species that we know that are homothalic, and there are only a few that people have done this for so far, of the 10% of all the mushrooms that are homothallic, but we always find that they have the wreckage of the genes for the tetrapolar mating system, and to different degrees they're, they become pseudogenes, they're basically interrupted in some way, and they're not functional anymore. So this is a derived condition, which basically makes it a, a, a candidate for an adaptation. And let's bring this back to Darwin. Okay. So, in addition to sexual selection, so I've heard sexual selection described as Darwin's other theory. This is Darwin's other, other theory. Um, so, in addition to the idea of sexual selection and natural selection, Darwin also did a lot of experiments with uh, plants. Um, uh, he and his son actually did some experiments where they described phototropism for the first time pretty well. Um, one of the things that he did was a book on the effects of cross and self-fertilization in plants. And in the book, um, basically he showed that if you take a normally outcrossing species and make it self, the offspring aren't very good. They have reduced height, vigor, reproduction. 
Basically, what he discovered was inbreeding depression. Okay? He discovered this, he thought of it as a general rule, but what he did know at the time was that lots and lots of plants self-fertilize all the time, and they don't seem to have any negative effects. And he really couldn't easily come up with a, an explanation for that. And actually, there's a throwaway line that I'm going to come back to that he kind of threw at the end of the book. It's actually kind of hard to find because it's nestled in a paragraph about something completely different. But he basically threw away and just threw out there probably what's the right idea, which is this idea that's come to be called reproductive assurance. Uh, the guys that came up with it are British, so think of it re as reproductive insurance is kind of the idea here. And the idea is really simple, is that if you can't mate with yourself, and as a species or as a population, you move into an area where you're very unlikely to find a mate, you're just going to go extinct. Okay? Because you're never going to find anybody to mate with, so you can't reproduce, so you die, and then you're gone. Right? So the <coughs> environment where that selfing is advantageous is when, over your lifespan, you would not find a compatible mate on average. And there are a variety of reasons why that might occur. It might occur following long distance dispersal. So if you disperse to an island, for example, probably you are the one that made it. Um, and you're not going to find a mate. So if you can't mate with yourself, you just go extinct and you're done and end of story. If you can, then you can establish a population on the island. And as long as you can overcome inbreeding depression, uh, you should survive. The same thing goes in colonizing new niches, and where it is most common in plants is in plants that reproduce annually. So if you complete your life cycle in, on an annual scale where you grow for a, a few weeks in a growing season and then you die and have to reproduce at the end of that, that's kind of dangerous, right? If you have to depend on another individual to fertilize your eggs, that's really dangerous because you might make it through that short window of time and be time to die and not have met a mate. And so that's another case where um, this kind of thing might work. So this idea has been kind of floating around there a lot since Darwin uh, with some mixed results. And uh, based on some work that Fisher did in the 1940s and some others, there's sort of a competing idea. And a lot of this actually has to do with the, the ideas about the origin of sex in the first place and the cost of sex in the first place. And the way genes for sex versus non-sex might be inherited. Um, Dr. Son will be interested in that part of it. The idea is called automatic selection. And the idea is, is that individuals that have genes for self-fertilization, they usually can also outcross if the opportunity presents itself. So if you have the genes for selfing, you can self, and all your offspring that you self-fertilize will have the genes for selfing. And all the, the individuals you produce through those accidental outcrossings will have those genes for selfing. And if you're outcrossing and you require to be outcrossing, only the, the individuals you mate with that are another outcrossing individual will have genes for outcrossing. And so the argument is, is that just because of the way they're inherited, as long as there's not selection against inbreeding, genes for, genes for selfing should spread in a population. Okay, so adaptation. Phylogenetic traits, we're back to that. So, what I'm interested in you know, is our adaptations, our particular traits, adaptations, and what are the selective forces that drive them into being? And so there are a variety of different ways that you can define adaptations, but ultimately they're derived conditions that evolved in response to some sort of natural selection. Um, and you can argue with different people about how you want to define adaptations. I want to look at a particular kind of adaptations which we can think of as convergences. Um, and to do that, we need a little bit of logic here. If we want to look at different species and how they behave, we can't treat species as individual and independent units. So if you want to compare like the ecology and some trait, 
for a bunch of species, those species are not independent units. They actually share a phylogenetic history. And there's a really important thing that happens here when we look at species. Two species can share a trait because they evolved it independently in response to selection in their environment, which is what we'd be interested in, or they could share a trait simply because they inherited that trait from their ancestor. Okay, why are crows black? That's one of Dr. Wagner's favorite questions. Okay. One of the answers is that their ancestors were black. Right? This really gets as exasperated if you have diversification. So if you have a bunch of species descended from an ancestor, they may all share the trait that you're interested in and the environment that you think drove the selection. So what's your end there? One. So the problem statistically, and, and when you think about adaptations and you're thinking about species, is that there are a variety of reasons why they could share traits. So this is not going to be that informative, but what, uh, what uh, Joe Felsenstein at the University of Washington proposed in the 1980s was the idea of using the phylogenetic tree that is the relationships between the species and the pattern of their evolution across that tree to develop contrast. And then when you compare the contrast, the contrasts themselves actually are independent. Okay. We're not going to use independent contrast because that's really for continuous characters. We're going to look at co-occurrence of discrete traits across a tree. Okay. So what I'm really interested in is how often do two traits occur together on a tree, and is that more likely than you'd expect by chance if those, those traits were randomly distributed across the tree? Okay. And there are a variety of approaches that you can use to do that. And I think convergence approaches are actually really interesting in evolutionary biology. I know like Coddington and some of these other evolutionary biologists really hate convergence because you know, convergence has happened multiple times, so are they really adaptations? Well, yeah. They're just adaptations that happen several times. Adaptations that have happened once, like the orb web in spiders, aren't as interesting, right? You can't think of good experiments to do to figure out why the orb web evolved because it happened once. Right? Something that happened a bunch of times really gives you the opportunity to, to, to think of is this pattern consistent with what we expect by chance or is it probably due to selection at some level? Okay. So people have look, been looking at reproductive insurance in a bunch of different organisms and they're all using very similar approaches to what I'm going to show you what I, what I did in... in, um, in uh, in fungi. I'm going to use the inky caps. Okay. The inky caps are mushrooms. Uh, they have a unique characteristic. It, uh, when they go to disperse their spores, they actually autolyse. They basically become this inky mess. They digest themselves. And the spores actually are often dispersed by insects instead of by the wind. Um, why I'm interested in them is not so much because uh, they're cool fungi, although they are really cool mushrooms, it's because they do a lot of what I'm interested in. So if we look across the group of fungi, the inky caps, what we find is that they have all the possible mating systems that I would be interested in looking at, and they incur environments that I think are likely to drive the evolution of particularly homothalism. And the particular ecology or life history trait that I'm most interested in is occurrence on dump. The way to think of dung is it's a very small sinking island in the middle of something that's not suitable, right? It's basically in the middle of an ocean of unsuitable habitat, and it's this tiny little island that goes away very quickly, with even, with, usually within just a couple of months, right? In particular, herbivore dung. Okay? Herbivores don't digest all their food material, so they leave something behind, and there are lots of fungi that are adapted to grow on herbivore dung. And so it makes a really good possibility to look at. So if we look at sort of what I've done here is I've actually combined a couple of things. I, this is uh, primary and secondary homothallic phallic species basically mapped onto a tree of other mating systems. So everything that's in yellow there is bipolar or tetrapolar. Everything in blue is some version of homothallic. And there's about eight or nine evolutions of homothallic in, in this group, depending on how you reconstruct the tree. Okay. 
This is occurrence on dung. Okay? Most of the species don't occur on dung. Most of the species occur on grass or something else, something that's more consistent in the environment. So then we just ask the question, how likely is it to get the association between dung and homothalism just by chance giving the distribution of dung on the, growing on dung on the tree? And basically it's very, very unlikely. So something about being on dung is driving the transition to homothalism. Okay. You can also expand this a little bit, and you can look at uh, the transition to being bipolar, homothallic, or some other shorter version of mating system. So you're increasing your selfing rate. And if we think about this in terms of automatic selection, or in terms of reproductive assurance, which are really the only good hypotheses out there to explain this, automatic selection alone doesn't do it. Because there's no reason to expect it should be tied to any particular environment. Whenever the genes for selfing show up in a population, they should spread if automatic selection is the driver. Okay? On the other hand, if reproductive assurance is the driver, any time they make a transition to a, a ephemeral, uh, long-distance dispersal, something like that, you would, should expect that transition, or at least the chance of that transition. And that's pretty much what you see. Um, I have a friend that works in some islands out in the middle of the Atlantic. And we applied this to his data for uh, these species that colonize these remote islands. Works just as well. So that, again, that transition to a, an environment where you might not find a mate seems to be really the driver of, of becoming homothallic and going to more selfing. And this is actually supported across a wide range of different uh, kinds of organisms as well. Spencer Barrett in Canada is one of the guys that I, I talked to quite a bit about this back in the day. And, and our data line up really, really nicely. There's one more idea out there. It's kind of a crazy idea. This is uh, uh, Buller. Uh, Buller was a very famous mycologist um, in the early 20th century. Also an art commerce and a collectivist. And basically what he came up with was an idea called the unit mycelium hypothesis to explain this kind of thing. And his idea was basically is you have a bunch of spores, but they have a limited resource. So that the way that they can actually get enough resources to reproduce is by cooperating. They split up things basically communistically. Okay? And you actually do observe this in a couple of species of the inky caps. Where if you take a bunch of spores, you put them on a petri dish or on a dung ball, which is what the illustration is, they grow together and they fuse together into one big mycelium. Now, this idea has been very influential for a long time, but it's really not a very good idea. Uh, first of all, it's very group selectionist. Uh, second of all, every single thing that he used to try to demonstrate this had either, is it either a species that's homothallic and has been homothallic probably for quite a while. So they're highly inbred anyway. So genetically, all the spores were probably identical genetically, so they had no way to discriminate each other. So they really weren't different individuals in, in any real sense. They were all genetically basically twins. Uh, the other thing he used it on were some species that are asexual, which they don't have sex at all, so genetically they're all the same. Uh, and uh, when we look at this, if we actually take these species where you have this cooperative fruiting, you take individuals that are different from different parts of the world and try to put them together, they don't cooperate anymore. They recognize each other as distinct, and they wall each other off, and they don't cooperate. So don't think there's any real way that this unit mycelium hypothesis actually can drive this, this kind of evolution. Um, and one more idea I think that's really important to bring up is that if you're selfing, you're giving up that genetic recombination. You're giving up genetic diversity. If you do that long enough, if you're asexual, if you don't do sex at all, or if you just self all the time, um, it creates problems. Uh, basically, then, as a population accumulates deleterious mutations or mutations that cause problems, they become more likely to go extinct. And so there's this idea out there called Mueller's ratchet, and basically, if we look at the tree for selfing, 
It looks a lot like the tree for asexual species where they've demonstrated Mueller's ratchet before. Basically, you give up sex, the likelihood that you're going to survive long term goes down really dramatically. And the likelihood that you're going to be extinct in the near future goes up dramatically. So it's one of those cases, I think, where uh, over the short term, it's beneficial to self when you transition to these environments. But probably over the long term, it's a bad strategy to adopt, which is kind of cool. Questions?